The purpose of this video is to demonstrate the basic procedural elements associated with bootstrapping and randomization, both of which are resampling procedures that I describe in the textbook. Now the example I'm going to use here is the correlation between education and earnings per day, and the sample size is 40. So the first thing I'm going to show you are the mechanics associated with bootstrapping, and then I'm going to show you the mechanics associated with randomization. They are actually very different and they produce very different results, at least on the surface, but you ultimately get a very similar result with respect to the testing of the null hypothesis. So with bootstrapping, what the computer does, or the program, is that it selects at random one case out of the 40, and I'll, let's just say I did that right now, let's, I'll select a case at random, a random sample of exactly one case from the first 40, click continue, and SPSS has chosen this case here to be selected out of the 1 out of 40. And a bootstrapping procedure would select a case and then copy and paste into another data file with education and earnings as the two columns and place that case as case number 1. Then it would go back to the original parent sample, if you will. It would get rid of its selection from the previous analysis, and it would select another case at random. It's unlikely to be exactly the same case that it chose the first time. Here we go. We got 17 and 206. And the program would put that like that. And it would keep doing this, selecting random cases out of the total 40 40 times to create a new sample. So I'll do it one more time. Select case, one random case, and it turned out to be this case here, 13 and 206. And what happens is that eventually the program will select up to 40 cases and then it'll run the Pearson correlation on that sample. And that's called sampling with replacement because each case has an equal chance of being selected each time. So it's not like the program selects 40 one at a time and reducing the sample size by one. It always frees up every case for selection, which means that you can actually select the same case twice amongst the sample size of 40. That can happen. So the program does this equal to the number of times you've specified the resamples, which in the textbook I specified 5,000 resamples. And 5,000 correlations were estimated based on these bootstrap samples of 40. And the result that you get is, at least based on the program I used in the, in the textbook, is you get exactly the same point estimate. It's actually 0.337. So the point estimate in bootstrapping is exactly the same that you would get with any other type of analysis. It has nothing to do with your point estimate. So the point estimate is 0.337 in bootstrapping. It's 0.337 with normal estimation theory as well. But the key result is related to the percentiles, or the 2.5th two, the percentile and the 97.5 percentile if you specify alpha at 0 0.05, which we almost always do in inferential statistics. So if you split that 0 0.05 into two, you've got 2.5% on the low side and 2.5% on the high side, which means that the percentiles in this sample of 5,000 repeatedly estimated correlations works out to negative 0.055, so 2.5% of the correlations were equal to negative 0.055, or even smaller, more negative, I should say. This correlation is negative 0.381. That was estimated from one of the samples of 40 that were drawn through the bootstrap procedure. So that's really quite a big negative correlation, and that happened just by chance. So the program has estimated the number of correlations that are equal to the percentile of 2.5% and all the way down to 1, or essentially 0. And we can see that there are a lot of those negative correlations. But the precise percentile equals to negative 0.55. And at the upper end, 
the correlation was estimated at as high as 0.621. Now because these confidence intervals intersected with zero, which means that one is negative and one is positive, we cannot reject the null hypothesis that the correlation that was estimated from the parent sample, the original data that we collected from the field, say, which is equal to 0.34 or 0.337, we cannot conclude that it's statistically significant via bootstrapping because one of the confidence intervals is negative and one of them is positive. And that's where I use the term in the textbook that the confidence intervals intersected with zero. We've crossed 0, 0.00 here, one negative and one positive. So via bootstrapping, we did not reject the null hypothesis. Now, randomization uses a different technique than bootstrapping. Instead of pulling out a case at random and putting it into a, another data file and doing that repeatedly until you have a sample size of 40, estimating a correlation, and then re-estimating a new sample of 40 by sampling with replacement from the parent sample. What randomization does is that it fixes the independent variable, usually, usually this is how the programs work, it'll fix the, these data in these cases, but in the dependent variable, it will randomly scramble the order of the data. So in the parent sample, in this case, the data run from 35.08, 63.01, 46.58, etc. And these value points are yoked. That's the word I use in the textbook. They're yoked together with an actual education value. But in randomization, the dependent variable, the y variable, is scrambled. The order is scrambled. And each time the computer program scrambles the order with which the y variables are presented in the data file, it runs a correlation with the x variable. So this is very different to bootstrapping. It's similar in the sense that it continues to re-estimate a correlation in data for which there is some random element to it, but in randomization, it's randomly scrambling the order of the earnings per day variable. And this consequently implies that the expected correlation is zero in this case. Whereas in bootstrapping, the expected correlation is not zero because you're not scrambling the order of the data. There should still be, on average, a positive correlation amongst the bootstrap samples. But in randomization, your expectation is that the correlation will be zero because you're just scrambling the order. So I'm going to show you what this looks like in the in distribution. So these are 5,000 correlations estimated from the bootstrap procedure. And we can see that the mean correlation was estimated at 0.32, which is not exactly the same as the point estimate of 0.337. And you wouldn't expect it to be exactly the same because the data in this case are actually not normally distributed. The standard deviation is equal to 0.173. So the 5,000 correlations estimated from the bootstrap procedure has a standard deviation of 0.173, which means that it also has a standard error of the correlation equal to 0.173. So we can see that there are correlations running in the negatives and some correlations in the positives. There are more positive. We can see that the zero point is right here. And only a relatively small percentage of the correlations are negative. Most are positive, And this is from the bootstrap procedure. However, with respect to rejecting the null hypothesis or not, some of the correlations, just a little bit too many, were on the negative side in order to reject the null hypothesis. And that's why this 2.5 percentile is actually equal to negative 0.055, which in this distribution would be somewhere about here, say. So 2.5% of the correlations are on this side. And it's just a little bit too many that we can't reject the null hypothesis. Now, randomization has a different distribution, although similar. This is the randomized correlations that I estimated from the 5,000 resampled cases. Notice that the mean is, exact, is exactly zero. And that's what you'd expect from a randomization procedure, because there's no expectation of a correlation when you're literally just scrambling the order of the data in one of the variables. 
The standard deviation is equal to 0.161, and that is the standard error of the correlation as estimated from randomization. And we can see that it's actually quite similar to the standard error of the correlation estimated from bootstrapping. 0.173 and 0.161 are definitely in the same ballpark, but they are not exactly the same either. And we can see here that the correlations are normally distributed around the mean of zero. Now we could calculate the statistical significance of a randomized correlation by dividing the point estimate correlation by the standard error. So in this case, we have 0.337 divided by 0.161, and that equals 2.93. One, six. Now we could also test that t value for statistical significance. And I did so here. It's actually, what did I get? 2.932. Get this into your view. 2.932 with 38 degrees of free, freedom and two tailed test. And this is using the t distribution x equal function, which I've used many times in a textbook up to now. And I get a p-value of 0 0.043. So that is rejecting the null hypothesis, which is a different result than that obtained by bootstrapping, which I discuss in a little bit more detail in the textbook about how you do get slightly different p-values estimating with different estimation techniques. Now, the way the program estimates the p-value that I used in the textbook is actually based on summing the proportions associated with the randomization procedure reported in the context of proportions of correlations observed equal to or greater than the point estimate correlation expressed in a positive sense and in a negative sense. So in this case here, you simply have to sum the p-values to get the p-value that's expressed in a two-tailed format. So if I calculated 0 0.0184 plus 0 0.0178, I get 0 0.0362, which is the p-value associated with the analysis of testing the correlation of 0.337 for statistical significance. And that is ballparkish in the same area of 0 0.043, which it's ballpark to the same p-value estimated by using the t-distribution and comparing that with the t value that was estimated from dividing the point estimate correlation from the standard error estimated from bootstrapping. So the last thing I'm going to point out is where do these proportions come from for randomization? Well, it's literally the number of correlations that were observed to be bigger than, in this case, negative 0.337. And that works out to those correlations about starting here and working your way all the way down, I actually calculated what those correlations worked out to be. So on the negative side, it was 89 correlations estimated to be larger than negative 0.337. And that gives you a p-value of a proportion of 0 0.0178. And then for the p-value of 0 0.0184, it was actually 91 of the resampled correlations. I should say 92. 92 of the correlations equaled or greater than 0.337, going through all the 5,000 resamples. So it's a lot. So if you take the time to actually count those, you'll see that the proportions add up that way. And that's how randomization, at least with this program, determines the statistical significance of a correlation. So that's the difference between, that's the mechanical difference between randomization and bootstrapping. And good on you for pursuing this, uh, this video and listening to this video to see the steps involved with bootstrapping randomization. I think it's important because they are very useful uh, estimation techniques for estimating p values. And to understand the difference between the two, you'll less likely forget these two techniques and, and actually understand why they are not subject to some of the assumptions associated with normal estimation theory.